Hi Dave, Scotland for CGSWAT.com and today we're going to have a look at the power of the RPF file and to a lot of After Effects users uh, the RPF file or the RLA file which is an alternative to the RPF file uh, might be a bit of a foreign idea for you um, but if you ever do any work in 3D um, it's a very powerful tool that you really should uh, have a look at. So this is a bit of an introductory tutorial and we're going to introduce you to some of the uh, powerful features of RPF file types and RLA file types. And just bear in mind that RPF and RLA are very similar in nature. There are a couple of features that an RPF has that RLA does not. And, uh, and we'll have a look. Um, RPF stands for Rich Pixel Format and RPF actually started its life as an RLA format uh, back in the days of silicon graphics machines where high-end uh, 3D or high-end computer graphics were done by very powerful silicon graphics workstations um, SGI is, uh, is the term that you may be familiar with and RLA is, was developed around that time to basically allow the file that you save a render as uh, to contain channel information other than your standard RGB uh, red green blue and alpha um, channel information uh, pertaining to things like Z depth uh, which is the d distance uh, the distance away from the camera um, the higher Z depth value the uh, the further you are away from the camera um, it also had a uh, very powerful object ID and material ID features that could be worked into the RLA file and it, it's gradually developed into an RPF file uh, due to the nature of change of file formats but basically allowing to incorporate some newer features into the file type um, and that's why we basically have two types the RLA and the RPF so we're going to be looking at RPFs in, in, this, uh, in this instance. Uh, it's, it's a file type I tend to use quite a bit just due to the power that it gives you in post-production without having to go back into the 3D environment and re-render various elements, allowing you to put various information embedded in the, in the file um, just gives you so much freedom in post to uh, do depth blurs, um, to isolate certain geometry, and so forth. So let's take a look. Uh, I've got a very easy scene, very simple scene I've put together here in 3D Max and we'll just go to a perspective view and I'll show you what I've got. Um, I've just got some primitive objects, a um, bit of a torus knot there, a sphere, a, a cube, a cylinder and a teapot back there and you'll see in wireframe that I've got a camera here and the camera's looking down. If I just switch to a camera view that's pretty much the view that we're seeing and uh, I set this up so that we can really have a look at how, uh, how RPFs work uh, in, in Z-Depth as well. So first of all, if I was to do a render of this uh, right now, I'll just uh, kick off a render. You may notice that, that they were buckets uh, moving around that render space. It's, I am using V-Ray. It's, uh, it's my render of choice and a very powerful render tool that I thoroughly suggest that you have a look into in the future if you're not using it already. Uh, third party render tool. So there's uh, there's my image uh, and if I go to a uh, alpha channel by clicking the uh, display alpha channel here, there's a, the simple alpha channel and then I've got my blue, green and red channels and that's basically your standard render out of Max and Scanline would give you the same information. Now if I use this drop down where it says RGB Alpha here, you'll notice that I only have RGB Alpha. And the reason for that, if I bring up my uh, render setup dialog and just slide in the common tab, slide down to the file type that it's set up as, you'll notice here that I've actually set it up, even though it's not ticked to save the file, it has been set up to save as a JPEG. Now a JPEG doesn't have any alpha, um, it, it doesn't have anything other than RGB, um, so that is why we're not getting any other information in that drop down, drop down win, uh, box there. So if I was to go into files and 
just change the type to RPF, RPF image file. You'll notice that RLA, RLA is just above it. RPF, and just just backspace here until we get rid of the uh, JPEG after the uh, the period. And then if I go save, it comes up with, and yeah, we do want to overwrite, it comes up with these RPF image file format. Now, very quickly, you'll see on the left-hand side, we've got uh, bits per channel, 8-bit, 16-bit, and 32. Um, that allows for different bit depth uh, per channel, and we'll go into that at a later stage when I do a detailed tutorial on, on bit depth. And we also have store alpha channel with a tick box and pre-multiply alpha channel with a tick box. So there straight away you can see that there is some power just just in that that little setting there with the ability to uh, get rid of your pre-multiplied alpha. Um, but the real power is over here on the right hand side and by default when you first use this feature everything should be switched off. And some of these, uh, a brief description of some of these. The Z depth, as I mentioned before, is the depth from the camera out into infinity. Um, and the further away the object is from the camera, the further it is into Z depth. And the closer, the closer it is into Z depth. Z depth. So let's just tick one of those for now. And we'll come back to, to this window. We're just going to tick Z depth. If I go OK, and just untick the save file, and I render that scene again you'll notice that just up above here we still have RGB alpha but now we've got Z depth and if I click on it you'll notice that it gives us an image and this is baked into the file information it's not an extra file that's that's generated it's this it's the same file and things that are closer to the camera are white and the further they are away from the camera it is it goes to black and uh, straight away you can see that that's quite a powerful tool if you're starting to talk about objects that you want to have drop into a uh, distance volumetric fog um, like in real life where the further an object is away the more volumetric particles of, of air and dust um, are in between you and the object therefore the fog increases as it is further away hence the mountains on the horizon are close to the color of the sky um, that's a very powerful tool and it's something that we're going to have a look at a little bit further once we render this uh, scene out and bring it into After Effects and just while I'm touching on After Effects just let me sh quickly show you where some of these features are I've just got a very simple scene that I've only just put a solid in there so that we can bring up some effects and just in the effects panel if I right click and, and the very top choice 3D channel that's where you'll find a lot of these powerful tools that take advantage of that channel information that's built into RPFs and RLAs. And take for instance uh, fog, 3D Fog. Um, 3D Fog gives you a, 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 a basically a fog that is based on the Z depth information of the file. And it allows you to reposition the fog, the density of the fog, um, another powerful tool uh, in that same 3D channel effects is ID mat, which allows you to use material ID and object ID to isolate various uh, elements within the same file, within a single file. And we'll go into that in just a moment where, where we have a look at object ID and material ID. But probably the most powerful in that, t in that list is depth of field. Depth of field, which you may be aware of, is something that we can build into a 3D camera in After Effects. Well, depth of field in this scenario allows you to take, um, provided that the layer that we're working on has Z depth information in it, um, the depth of field will take that Z depth information and it will allow you to create a blur effect, a depth of field blur, camera blur, which mimics real life in that if I focus on something that's in the middle foreground area then things that are further away drop into blur and things that are very close to the camera are also blurry and we're going to have a look at that feature in uh, in just a while so I'll just close down After Effects and in back in Max we'll go back into the file setup and we'll have a look at some of these other features so just go into the render output files again and we'll just toggle uh, uh, setup and 
some of the other features, material ID and object ID. Well, every object in a, in a 3D scene that has a material assigned to it has a material ID assigned to it. And in 3D Max, if I just bring up your material IDs here, your material editor, every single swatch in a default material editor has the material ID, it's this little button here, of zero. Material ID channel is zero. And by default, every material you apply to an object has a material of zero until you change this number. And there's, if I hold down the mouse, I have all of these numbers that I can change change it to. And with a little bit of scripting, we can go higher than 15 as well. Um, and the other option that we were looking at there is object ID. Well, object ID allows you to select an object, right click and bring up the object's properties. And just down here, we have the object ID in the G buffer zone. And or I have already set up that sphere to have an object ID of three. And if I select a different object, go into the object properties, it has the object ID of four. And every piece of geometry that you create in 3D Max always starts its life with an object ID of zero. And if you want to change that object ID, you have to go into the, um, the object properties and just go to that G, uh, G buffer and change that number there. It can also be done with, with a script sort of screen, screen wide. So you'll see now that I've got everything set to, to different uh, object IDs. And if we just bring up that uh, render dialog again, we'll go into files and set up again. So we'll tick both of those. And UV coordinates, basically that's the coordinates of the UV mapping of objects that can, that can be in, embedded into the R, RPF file, quite handy for, for various functions later on in post. Uh, normal mapping, we'll tick that. Um, basically normal mapping is, is the direction that the face is f the the uh, the surface is facing at that point on the object, and uh, it's there's quite a handy map that is generated, uh, a, a normal map that is generated once you render. If you tick this button here, um, non-clamped color is is something that I don't generally use. Um, it's something that you can have a look into with a bit of trial and error. Coverage is basically something that I tick because it does help with masking out later in post. But basically coverage gives you a, an outline of each object. But we'll uh, have a look at that. If we leave that on and I do a render, we'll be able to have a look at these, much the same way we had a look at the Z depth. Um, node render ID, we don't really need that on at the moment, uh, but that's self-explanatory. It's, it's a node render ID. Um, it allows you to use an ID for uh, um, a node render. And we have color, transparency, we can tick these. Um, they're fairly self-explanatory as well. Transparency is, is a little different to alpha, but we'll have a look at that when we bring it into uh, After Effects. Velocity is uh, quite a handy, um, it's quite a handy feature to build into the RPF file because in post, if we're doing uh, any sort of motion blur, um, velocity can be read using various effects. Uh, Subpixel sub weight and subpixel masking, they're two elements that are unique to RPF images that RLA images don't have. And uh, they're quite handy. Subpixel masking is a, a good one to have because it does allow you to sort of defringe the mask just a bit. And subpixel weight uh, it has a lot to do with, um, uh, with the velocity. So we'll just tick that one. We'll go OK and come back out of here and we'll just do a quick render. And now you'll see with our drop down here, we have all of those features that we just ticked. So we have our Z depth, we have material ID. Now it's all the same because the same material is applied to every object in the scene. But if I was to quickly bring up my material editor, go to this next material, will make its ID 1 and we'll apply it to the torus here and uh, we'll just give it a give it a fake name and we'll we've applied that to the torus now if I render the image it looks just just as standard in the RGB render 
but if I bring down my material ID, the torus is isolated. It, it, it shows that the torus is carrying different material ID to the rest of the objects. And if I go to object ID, every object in the scene has a unique color. Um, and that's just a graphic, um, a graphic cue to let you know that those objects have different object ID when we're looking at them through the object ID helper here. And normal, this is, uh, this is normal mapping that I mentioned before. Um, normal mapping just pretty much allows you to map the normals uh, of, of the objects and basically the normal is the direction that a surface is facing at 90 degrees to the surface. Um, that's uh, something I'll get into a little bit more in depth at a later stage when I do some a uh, little bit more 3D tutorials. Coverage, that's that outline that I was uh, talking about before. Um, it's a sort of a, a fringed area of, of the objects. Uh, we have color, and the color is, is pretty much uh, the same as an RGB. And we have transparency, which is very similar to um, an alpha channel, but it does give you a little bit more power later on in post. And we have velocity, and that'll make a lot more sense. What you're looking at there will make a lot more sense once we uh, have a look in post, how that, how that actually comes together. And we have sub pixel masking. It's not, it doesn't really show up as, as an element, uh, but it is very handy later on when we're in post and we're trying to uh, get a good mask on object IDs and material IDs. I'm going to go away now and set this file up so that it's a little bit more interesting to render out. But remember that this tutorial isn't really about lighting and V-Ray materials and backgrounds and things like that. It's about the power of that RPF. So all you really need to know is that our objects have a different object ID and uh, could just as easily have a different material ID and uh, and basically I'm going to uh, go away and do set that up in a file and come back and we'll have a quick look at it okay so this is the scene that I've put together um, just using a, a background that I got down off the internet a bit of a road leading off into the distance there and I've got some, uh, there's our geometry and uh, the base plates just made see-through just to allow me to line up our geometry a little bit better but I'll show you a quick render of what that looks like remembering that this isn't a tutorial on uh, photo reel mapping of, of geometry into a, into a scene or, or anything like that. It's really about the power of the RPF. So this is going to do nicely for what we need. And if we have a look at Z depth, we've got our Z depth information there and we've got our object ID information there and that's going to get us started. So let's save that out. Uh, we'll bring up our last render RPF and we're going to just call this road RPF and I'll include the max file for you to use at your own discretion. You can re realign objects and, uh, and these sorts of things. So you'll have the max file to work from um, if you want to have a look at how I've put together some of this. Just reverse engineer that max file a little bit. Okay, so we've saved that out now and now we're going to move over to After Effects.